First in the session is Helena de Grote, who will give us a talk on endoscopic ultrasound and measurement of portal pressure. Please, Helena. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So we will have a short talk about endoscopic ultrasound and measurement of portal pressure. So first, of course, why is it important to measure the portal pressure? Uh, in patients, sometimes you have to confirm the presence of portal hypertension. It can, it can also give some information about the type or the cause of the portal hypertension. Uh, the presence of portal hypertension also has a prognostic value. Uh, and it can guide uh, the treatment and the response to treatment if we know uh, the evolution of the portal pressure. Uh, this is a well-known slide. It's actually uh, to explain uh, the existence of portal hypertension. So it's the result of, of course, um, elevated resistance, uh, for example, because of uh, sinusoidal distortion in liver fibrosis and also an elevated vascular resistance. And there is also an increase in flow because of splanchnic, va splanchnic vasodilatation, uh, resulting in hypovolemia, uh, an activation of the RAS and angiotensin system, uh, um, sodium retention, and also in hyperdynamic circulation, uh, resulting in an elevated cardiac output. And this all together results in portal hypertension. In patients, we can see the results of that uh, with symptoms of hepatic encephalopathy, varices, and ascites. Uh, after ascites, you can have diuretic refractory ascites uh, evolving towards hepatorenal syndrome. So it's an important um, problem uh, and it needs to be further evaluated. There are also different causes of uh, portal hypertension. It's most of the time divided into three sections. Post-hepatic um, hypertension, sinusoidal portal hypertension, and prehepatic uh, sinusoidal, sinusoidal hypertension. We will not go completely through this because uh, there are a lot of causes, but it's very important to understand, for example, in um, cirrhosis, due to primary biliary cirrhosis, it's actually a pre-sinusoidal um, cause. So it's not always uh, sinusoidal, and that's important for the next of the, for the continuation of the talk. So what is already known about this technique? So first, it was uh, developed in an animal model, uh, and they showed that under general anesthesia with a 25 gauge needle, um, there was 100% technical success rate and there were no adverse events. So after that, there was a human pilot study um, that showed that echoendoscopic portal pressure gradient measurements were feasible and safe and that it correlated with clinical parameters or of portal hypertension. So this was a single center study retrospective. It uh, included 28 patients uh, who had a history of liver di disease or cirrhosis, uh, and the um, clinical parameters of portal hypertension were defined as the presence of varices and thrombocytopenia. Again, a 25 gauge needle was used uh, and directly connected with a manometer, of course. It was under anesthesia in supine position, and also there was a 100% technical success rate and no adverse events. And it showed that there was a correlation uh, with the measured pressure gradient and the clinical parameters. And then very recently, they went a step further because it's of course uh, important to show if it correlates with an indirect pressure gradient. Um, and this study that was published in 2021 showed that an echoendoscopic uh, pressure gradient measurement correlates with an indirect pressure gradient uh, in acute and subacute portal hypertension. So it's not yet in cirrhotic patients. Uh, there were nine cases included, and it were mostly um, sinusoidal obstructive disease and some Budd-Chiari patients. And they showed that the uh, echoendoscopic portal pressure gradient, um, they measured it between uh, the porta and the vena cava inferior because sometimes the hepatic veins were too thin and they used a 22 gauge needle. <coughs> it was performed with patients under sedation, so it's a bit different with the previous studies. Uh, and the uh, indirect pressure uh, gradient was, was performed with patients that were awake. Uh, and they saw that uh, there was a correlation between uh, echoendoscopic portal pressure gradient measurements and an indirect portal pressure gradient. And uh, furthermore, this technique succeeded in two cases when it was not possible to do an indirect uh, gradient. So that were both patients with Budd-Chiari syndrome. 
Uh, and there was one case where the indirect measurement was inaccurate because of hepatic venations. So in those cases, they see an <coughs> extra value of doing an echoendoscopic <coughs> guided measurement. So to conclude, uh, doing an echoendoscopic portal pressure gradient, gradient measurement is accurate for pre, post, and sinusoidal portal hypertension. Uh, it's more accurate than an indirect measurement in pre-sinusoidal <coughs> portal hyper uh, hypertension. And it can also be used in cases where the hepatic veins cannot be accessed or when the wedged hepatic vein pressure cannot be obtained. And another uh, advantage is, of course, that it can be combined with, for example, screening for varicious, uh, further surveillance, uh, echoendoscopic guided liver biopsy, echoendoscopic based liver elastography, and other uh, endoscopic assessment. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, and I um, am happy to answer any further questions. Thank you, Helena, for this nice presentation. Unfortunately, you have to run. You yes. have to go to the RCP. But in the meantime, yep. I, I think uh, Anja can switch and, yep. and uh, Geraldine can come in. Perhaps go, go, going further on this talk of Helena, I think we, we, we seldomly hear in Ghent, we seldomly use the hepatic venous gradient to, to, to look into our patient. I want to know to, of Geraldine if in UCL the routine use of uh, pressure, measurement, pressure measurement is used in your hospital? We essentially use the pressure measurement by, uh, yes, catheter. Yeah. We don't do that with echoendoscopy. And in which indication you... Uh... Oh, we do that especially in a uh, patient in which uh, cirrhosis has to be diagnosed or uh, in uh, alcoholic patients when the fibroscan is a bit uh, higher than F2. We just perform that in uh, studies uh, to see if there is cirrhosis. Uh, Yes, if there is a contraindication of liver biopsy percutaneously, mm. we just do a uh, transjugular uh, biopsy yes. and then a gradient mm. uh, on the same time. That's the main indications we have for the moment. Yeah, okay. Before also hepatectomy, large mm. hepatectomy for tumors, uh, if we have an enlarged spleen or if we have platelets that are just in the limit, mm. we sometimes also use that to see mm. if we can go for uh, uh, surgery. And, and do we see an, uh, an alternative of this echoendoscopic technique in comparison with the classical one? I look around to my... Yeah, I think it's a nice technique. It's, it's, uh, I think it's easy to perform when you have lots of experience. And also I think it's good eh, because um, Helena explained eh, sometimes eh, we have a normal eh, result and there is a pre-hepatic eh, portal hypertension. So I think... Eh, that's a good indication huh, to look uh, for that. Um, you can also take, um, I don't, it was not included in Helena, her presentation, but you can also take biopsy. Huh, so that's also an advantage of uh, this technique. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think this technique has a lot of future huh, and a lot of indications. Well, setting a step forward, should this be a new approach of, for example, placement of a tips on an echoendoscopic way? I, uh, it's not used of this at this moment, but perhaps it could be an alternative. Mm, no, no. <laughs> I think it's the first step to go. But <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm still looking a bit, uh, a bit, bit further. Yeah. So if you have remarks on, on this talk? No, I think it's a very elegant technique. As mm. we heard, there are no major complications mm. that have been reported in the first studies. And also, as was already mentioned by Anya, you can have a very complete assessment of your patient mm. in a non-invasive way, which includes screening for varices, uh, measuring portal pressure, maybe performing liver biopsy. And that's, I think, a very elegant approach and, and probably will also be cheaper both for the patient and for the community mm. than performing a catheterization um, in, as we do it today. So we look forward to the, the next story about this. So, yeah, what do we need to do? APC or band ligation? This is a recent publication, a um, um, uh, systematic review, and you see uh, the transfusion requirements of the number of sessions and hospitalizations are probably in favor for the band ligation. This is also a recent publication where you see the band ligation is in favor eh, to reduce the number of hospitalizations, the number of sessions, the sessions until cessation of the uh, transfusion need, and also endoscopic remission. 
So, and when you look into details of all the papers, huh, the favoring ligation is most of the time seen in the diffuse gave. So this is an important message. Another technique that comes into the picture is radiofrequency ablation. Of course, with this technique, you can reach a wider surface area of the mucosa. Only studies performed in refractory patients. The medium number of sessions needed are two. Here you see the pictures also using uh, most of the time for diffuse gave. You see uh, the uh, frequency ablation method, and after several months, there can be a complete resolution of GAVE. And also, radiofrequency ablation will reduce the number of transfusion and also increase hemoglobin and reduce the number of hospitalizations. So this brings me to a treatment algorithm for patients with GAVE. So the first option is APC, but as already I mentioned it, an alternative first treatment is bending, and you can use this in a diffuse GAVE. You can repeat session. If there is no control, you can switch from um, treatment option, so from APC to bending. And we, when you have a refractory case, consider radiofrequency ablation or you can always uh, uh, look to the surgeon and have a rescue uh, therapy, the surgical anthrectomy. And it is also known that very sick patients with MEL score above 25 will experience more liver uh, biliary strictures after liver transplantation. And then uh, other risk factors are related to those uh, complications, immunological, surgical related, uh, due to the characteristics of the donor and uh, also to organ preservation. But why is the bile duct so sensitive to uh, ischemia? It is because uh, the vascularization of the bile ducts only depends on the hepatic artery, unlike the rest of the liver, which depends on the portal vein and the hepatic artery. And when ischemic, um, ischemia uh, occurs, then there can be microthrombi and ischemic type lesions occurring on, on the bile duct. So therefore, it's very sensitive. With the organ shortage, we have to choose more and more extended criteria donors or less quality donors. And therefore, we will surely experience in the future more and more um, biliary damage. And so we have to know that and we have to find solution to avoid that. So the donor risk index score can help us to define the, um, the follow up of the uh, liver, the transplanted liver. And this score uh, is based on uh, several variables, and some of these are related in the literature uh, to a biliary complication and biliary strictures. Age is still controversial. Um, a study uh, of patients, um, of donors above 75 years old, has shown the same results af as donors uh, less uh, younger than 75 years old, but other series have. Uh, shown that uh, older age was related to more uh, biliary strictures. What is true is that DCD donors are more related with ITBL than the brain dead donors, uh, because surely of uh, additional warm ischemia time, uh, mainly uh, at the time of the procurement, before the procurement. And then it is well known then that partial split liver uh, living donation is also related with more biliary uh, stenosis. Then steatosis is not part of this donor risk index, but steatosis above 25% is related to um, much more biliary complications. In pediatric series, hypernatremia before uh, donation has also been linked uh, in biliary complications. Then several immunological factors are important to note to be related to biliary complications. Then CMV infection, CMV viremia, and primary CMV infection is related to biliary complication and biliary strictures post-transplantation. The appearance, the occurrence of um, anti-HLA antibodies class 2, uh, um, specific, specific of the donor called DSA, are also related to the occurrence of biliary strictures. 
as well as acute or chronic rejection or a positive cross match uh, at the time of the transplantation. Then the surgeon is central in the transplantation. So what can we say about the surgeon? So there is no consensus on the type of suture or on the type of material to use to perform the uh, bile duct anastomosis. What is true is that the anastomosis has to be tension free um, because otherwise it will, um, it will uh, favor strictures. Here on the uh, left part, you see a drawing of our surgeon uh, that made a uh, duct-to-duct anastomose with, with a T-tube. T-tube has also a lot of controversies in its uh, usage uh, after uh, liver transplantation. But we use it for all DCD donors to have an earlier access and an easier access during the first three months post-transplantation to um, be able to diagnose earlier strictures inside the liver. On the right part, you see that uh, uh, a drawing of a biliary digestive anastomosis because the tension-free anastomosis was not possible. Then how will we diagnose these, uh, these strictures? Because the clinical presentation will be very heterogeneous. Sometimes it will be asymptomatic. We can see elevation of the GGT and alkaline phosphatases, but sometimes it will be very challenging because patients will experience acute cholangitis. And even after several weeks or months, uh, we can see the occurrence of um, secondary biliary cirrhosis. It has to be, it's, it's important to make the differential diagnosis with hepatic artery thrombosis, episodes of rejection, or the sepsis, acute hepatitis after liver transplantation. But we have several diagnostic tools um, besides clinics and uh, biological. Ultrasound has to be a first step, but it has to be mentioned that ultrasound, uh, on ultrasound, the bile ducts are not always dilated after liver transplantation. So it will not completely, if the, the bile ducts are normal, we cannot say that there is no stricture. If a hepatic artery thrombosis or stenosis is suspected, then the first step will be an angioct. MRCP, MRI, is a, a very interesting tool. But the gold standard is still direct PTC. That is not without morbidity, so we have to put that in the balance. And ERCP can be a diagnostic tool, but is more a treatment tool. Here you see the diagnostic performance of MRCP for biliary complications after liver transplantation. And you see that the sensitivity and specificity are very good compared to the standard of reference. So it should be used as a second step. But should we preventively diagnose this stricture or should we only uh, treat when it's um, as a curative option? So here our um, group has... Um, Ha, has uh, performed this stud retrospective study comparing routine cholangiography um, or patients who had cholangiography because clinically indicated. We perform in all our patients a routine cholangiography depending on the presence on a T-tube or not at three or six months. And you see that patients with routine cholangiography, we diagnosed in up to one third of the patients a stricture even without clinically indicated. But what was interesting is that in our series, we didn't uh, show any, uh, dif uh, any difference in the graft survival in uh, our population if they had a stricture diagnosed early or if they had no stricture. So what's needed is maybe a, a prospective study comparing routine cholangiography, treatment of stricture diagnosed without any clinical sign, uh, or not treat them and see if there is a change in the follow-up, knowing that uh, the only risk factor uh, for the graft survival was the age of donor, recipient, and the presence of biliary uh, proliferation on the liver biopsy. Yes. But I think there is really a place for the machine perfusion, I think, mm -hmm. in the prevention of, of this uh, Achilles piece, Achilles uh, tendon problem in, in, in transplantation, yes. which was nicely published this year in, in, in New England Journal, where Indeed, the, the, the problem of bile duct problems 